Hello everyone, my name is Alicia Castro and I'm a student at Grand Canyon University. I'm currently in the class SPD 300 and this is my special education law presentation video. If you're interested in finding out what this video is about, then stay tuned and keep on watching. So this video is going to be broken down into three parts. The first one being some brief information on how the special education laws have changed before the 1970s and from the 1970s to present day. The second part being a brief description of two court cases that talk about parental rights and students' educational rights. And the third part being what my state is doing to keep up to date with um, current legal trends in special education. So let's take it back to when all of this started. So we had a lot of students with learning disabilities who were not taking advantage of what education was. And the reason for that was because people didn't believe in them. Um, they didn't think that people with learning disabilities deserve to have a great education. So there are three websites that I used. The first one is called Rights Law. The article is The History of Special Education Law in the United States. The second one is Special Education Law in New Jersey. Um, these are landmark cases in special education law. The lawyer's name of this website is Lori E. Ahrens, and she's a special education lawyer. And then finally, the third one that I used is TCTA, Texas Classroom Teachers Association. And it basically talks about what the IDEA is and how Texas is keeping up to date. So the very first thing that we're going to talk about is Brown versus Board of Education. This is a direct quote from the first um, website. So it says, quote, in Brown, school children from four states argued that segregated schools were inherently unequal and deprived them of equal protection of the laws. The Supreme Court found that African-American children had the right to equal educational opportunities and that segregated schools have no place in the field of public education, end quote. So basically, when the state and the local government work together, it is a gateway to teach students cultural value, train them in a profession, and also adjust them to what their environment is. Um, this is an opportunity that must be made available on all equal terms. Segregation of children in public schools deprive them from the minority group of equal education opportunities. Separation of white and colored children has a determinantial effect upon the colored children. Motivation goes down, educational and mental well-being is affected as well. When all of this comes together, parents of children with learning disabilities begin to bring lawsuits against their schools. Segregation was not only for the colored and white, but also for children with disabilities. That brings us to the Elementary and Secondary Act of 1965, also known as ESEA. This is a direct quote. In 1966, Congress amended the ESEA to establish a grant program to help students in the initiation, expansion, and improvement of programs and projects for the education of handicapped children, end quote. So basically what this was is that they were offered a grant and they were able to go and get an education. There were big changes made throughout the years in 1966 through 1970s. Um, great changes for children with disabilities came into play. Just in 1970, Congress enacted the Education of the Handicapped Act. This encouraged states to develop educational programs for individuals with disabilities. This was basically an open door for the handicapped society and where they were able to get a good education. Parks and Mills. Um, Parks and Mills was another one. Parks dealt with an exclusion of children with mental retardation from public schools. That was a direct quote. It was settled that educational placement decisions must include a process of parental participation and a means to resolve disputes. This is where IEP meetings come into play. So now that parents were able to join in on what was happening in the student schools, their voices were going to be heard. Mills, on the other hand, quote, involved the practice of suspending, expelling, and excluding children with disabilities from the District of Columbia Public Schools, end quote. And basically what this was, he was arguing the fact that if there was high cost of education for children with learning disabilities. Um, this brings us to a congressional investigation of 1972. An investigation was led on by Congress addressing many of the arguments presented by Parks and Mills. So it was found that millions of children were not receiving an appropriate education. Members of Congress wrote that if we provide a better form of education to children with disabilities, they will learn to be more productive and independent, meaning that they will not rely so much on taxpayers' money and on the society. 
They also wrote that providing educational services will diminish the need for institutional settings. Um, if we visit a residential institution, we will get to witness that thousands of people live in these subhuman conditions. This is because many families are finding themselves in situations that they cannot afford to take care of their loved ones. In 1972, legislation was passed making it that handicapped children have the right to education. So this brings us to the Education for All Handicapped Children Act of 1975. In 1975, President Gerald Ford signed a new law that ensured all children with disabilities had access to an education and due process of law. They included procedural safeguards, which is a system of checks and balances um, that were also included. These were put into place to protect the rights of children and their parents. So then that brings us to the IDEA. Um, since 1975, the Special Education Act has been amended and renamed. On December 3rd of 2004, the IDEA was amended. Congress increased the focus on accountability and improved outcomes by emphasizing reading, early intervention, and research-based instruction. Special education teachers need to be highly qualified. There are two phases. Prepare the children for further education, employment, and independent living. And two, protect the rights of both children and dis with disabilities and their parents. So now we move on to part two, which is the two court cases about parental rights and students' educational rights. So the very first one that I want to talk about is a Burlington School Committee versus Massachusetts Board of Education. This happened in 1985. So I'm just going to read this off of the website here from Lori E. Ahrens. The court established for the first time the right of parents to be reimbursed for their expenditures for private school education. This decision generally stands for the proposition that a school district may be required to reimburse parents for tuition and other expenses related to a private school placement when, one, the IEP and placement offered by the school districts were inadequate or inappropriate. Two, the parent's private placement was appropriate for the child's needs. And three, the balance of the equity favors reimbursement. The court also explained that in an IDEA dispute, a court has broad authority to fashion appropriate relief considering equitable factors which will effectuate the purposes underlying the act and the IDEA provides, quote, procedural safeguards to ensure the full participation of the parents and proper resolution of substantive disagreements, end quote. So that was one. The second one is Jacob Winkleman versus Parma City School District in 2007. And it says here, the court determined that parents may pursue claims under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act on their own behalf as the rights conferred to parents under the act exist independently from the rights of the child. That brings us to the third part of this video, which is what is the IDEA and what it what is it doing to stay up to date? So the IDEA is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, in order for you to be eligible, a student cannot be labeled with a specific learning disability if the child's low achievement is due to lack of appropriate instruction in reading or math. The U.S. Department of Education stated that stated in comments accompanying the federal regulation that whether a child has received appropriate instruction is appropriately left to state and local officials to determine. There is help for struggling learners. So the IDEA allows schools to use up to 15% of the federal special education funds they receive to develop and implement coordinated early intervention services for students in kindergarten through grade 12. And then who gets the IEP? Federal regulations require that children's IEP must be accessible to each regular education teacher and anyone else responsible for its implementation as soon as possible after it is finalized and before beginning work with the child. So as far as my experience goes with IEP meetings, um, I will say that a regular ed teacher is there, a special education teacher is there, a couple of their therapists are available as far as for our case, it was speech it was the speech therapist, the physical therapist, and the occupational therapist. Um, and then finally, counselor, and, and then finally, the principal. 
So this is it for my presentation. I hope that you guys understood basically what special education laws are. There are so many things that we can look up um, as far as how special education laws have changed from the 1970s and on. And I'm pretty sure that they're going to keep on changing. So if you like this video, hit that like button. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more GCU videos. Thank you for watching. Bye.